Welcome everybody to the Trauma Recovery Show. I'm Wendy Keir, your host, the author of the book, Be More Wolf, The Survivor's Story, Breaking the Trauma Cycle. So we've come together today to talk about a deeply personal story around trauma and the relationship with the impact it has had on our lives and the significant others around us. So I'd like to welcome today, Keelan. Thank you. Uh, pleased to be here. And let's just quickly get into your surname because it is actually a beautiful name. Uh, yeah, well, my name is Kellen Flukiger and Flukiger is Swiss. I used to have the umlaut and so it had, uh, was pronounced Flukiger, that way with the little dots over it. But now uh, it's been dropped for many generations. So Kellen Flukiger is the name. Oh, it's a great name. It's a great name. Love it. So we're obviously going to be talking about something that is deeply personal for the audience. If you're listening to this and you feel that you are emotionally triggered in some way, please do reach out to either one of us and get help or reach out to other professionals or your doctor. You know, don't I think the thing with trauma is, is we struggle with it for so long and we really don't need to. We often think that our stories are unique and they just belong to, not, belong to us. Well, they are unique, let's face it. But there are people who will be able to help you. So let's start at the beginning then of your personal trauma story. Well, my, um, my, the, I, I will tell you all of it. I'm completely open about anything. The most important thing to get from this is regardless of how much trauma there is, I just totally agree with what she said, what you just said, uh, that you don't have to stay with it. It doesn't have to be permanent. You don't have to live there and there's a way forward. And that was, might have been the greatest discovery because for me, I didn't do anything about what was going on with me for 40 years. So I'll explain a little bit more about that. I was raised in a very religious, fanatic sort of home. My mom was determined to enforce the beliefs with physical violence. Today, that discipline would be felony child abuse, and we would have been removed from the home. Uh, without impugning, I mean, they, my parents were married, and they stayed married. My, neither one of them was an alcoholic or a drunk. There was just a, a real belief that force was the way to create a desired behavior. And so I remember, for example, uh, when I was young, uh, you know, being well, the regular emotional stuff, screaming, swearing, slapping, and all that stuff. But the physical beatings were pretty bad. I remember in high school, even, this would have been at 14 or 15, getting dressed last in the locker room because I didn't want anybody to see that I was, you know, black and blue on the back backside stuff. Anyway, the, so without bragging on my parents or my mom, what it left me with was a absolute certainty that I was not good enough, that I could never be okay, and that nothing that I did would ever be good enough. The other thing that was drilled into you, or me at the time, was you can't talk to anyone. This is all in the house, secret. This is how we live. Everybody else is bad. We're doing the right things, and everybody else that doesn't believe, behave the way we do, they're all wrong. And thirdly, that you can't talk to anybody about the way you feel because everybody that is a psychologist or counselor, they're godless pigs. And so you can't talk to them either. So I, was, I lived in this entire isolation. I remember as early as age 13, uh, sniffing gasoline to you know, use, start using drugs to escape from the pain that I felt. And it wasn't peer pressure or anything. It was solitary. I was alone. So it wasn't like friends, you know, tried to push me to do anything. Bottom line is from about age 13 until I was 53. So 40 years, almost exactly. I spent my entire life trying to prove that I was okay mm -hmm. and get my mother's approval. And that might sound ridiculous when you think of someone that's an adult trying to do that. But I did because I accepted the story that I was fundamentally flawed, that I was busted, that everything that was wrong was my fault. And if I felt bad, it was my fault and I should just suck it up and be better. That sort of feeling, right? And that's not uncommon, especially in the years that I'm talking about. So what it did to me is I lived 
in silence. I never talked to anyone about how I felt. I tried to be what I was supposed to be. So I went and got jobs and tried to climb up in corporate stuff. And I was very successful at that. I was blessed with brains and talent. And so I got jobs and got promotions and, uh, you know, I made good money. And I kept thinking each of those accomplishments would, would garner me the approval that I so desperately craved. Well, my mom hated the woman that I married in my first marriage. And so we were disincluded from stuff. I was banned from participating in the, my, bro, my younger brother's wedding and because they, she didn't approve of me and, you know, those kinds of things that went on. And I kept believing, well, it's my fault. If I was just better, it would be okay. And not surprisingly, I didn't know how to be an adult. I didn't know how to have a friend or be a friend. I didn't know what love was. And so I ended up ruining that marriage and I got divorced. And then I was in even worse trouble because getting divorced was even more evil. So then I was, uh, you know, off way off the reservation. So then, of course, that led to repeated cycles of the same thing. I would sabotage my jobs. I would get another job, do better, make more money. I got married a second time and that's that lasted for a while. Uh, and then inevitably the continuous disapproval uh, rankled me to the point that I sabotaged the work that I was doing. I ended up in rehab. I got divorced a second time, uh, married and divorced a third time. I ended up in and out of rehab and, and drug addict and everything else. And at the same time, held down high powered jobs and made a lot of money. So it was just exactly like you see in movies where some dude is big dog, this, that, and the other, and his private life is a wreck, a total and absolute wreck. And I lived like that with those cycles of hating myself, putting on a show for the world, being successful, but being completely empty, ruining my success by doing something stupid, getting divorced again, one, two, three times, and being in and out of rehab. And that cycle went on and on and on without all the details for 40 years. Uh, finally, if you want the details, I wrote it all in a book called Tightrope of Depression, my journey from darkness, despair, and death to light, love, and life. So if you're interested in details, it's in that book. But anyway, in 2008, seven, the very end of 2007, which is now 14 years ago, last month, I had a, a divine intervention and that, that constituted a, I, I'll just say it like it is, and you can make out of it whatever you want, a 17-hour out-of-body experience where I felt like I lived in hell for that amount of time. I didn't know how long it was at the time, but I was in hell reviewing all of the scenes of my life. And at the end of that time, a, a voice said, it is enough. And it wasn't an angry voice or an accusing voice. It just said, it is enough. So I, I woke up, came to, <clears throat> all that time had passed, which I had no idea how or what, but I, had, I was out of body somewhere. But anyway, I considered that to be an invitation. So I threw away all the drugs that I had. I went from a $3,000 a week cocaine habit. And again, I was making so much money that $3,000 a week was lunch money. 3,000 bucks a week to zero in one day. So I got sober in a day, but that did not change anything about the depression, which had got me there. That was a much longer process. <clears throat> in the same time, like literally two weeks, after that event, the divine brought another person into my life because I wouldn't be able to do this alone. And here's the story how that happened. And that won't make any sense either, but it happened. So in the positions that I held, I used to get all kinds of free stuff because I was making big decisions worth billions of dollars. And so people gave me free tickets, free this, free that. I suppose if I had allowed it to, it would have been bribes, but I didn't do that sort of stuff. But it was like, everything else, like free, whatever I want, dinners and tickets and whatever. So I got a pair of tickets to see Yo-Yo Ma. If you're, if you're a classical music fan, you know who that is. If you don't, you don't, that's fine. He's the world's most electrifying cellist and by himself alone on a stage, he can capture an entire auditorium. Anyway, I got a couple of tickets to see him. And of course I was single again for the third time. And I always gave the other ticket away to somebody. And I said, who likes classical music? in the groups that I managed and somebody said, I do. And it was a woman, uh, I knew her, but kind of whatever. And I said, have I ever given you anything before? No. Okay. Here, meet you there. 
And so we went to the concert. <clears throat> we met there. Of course, the tickets were together. And halfway through the concert, and again, this was two weeks after that other extraordinary experience. I had this really strong feeling and a voice in my head that said, uh, yeah, you need to marry this woman. And I said, you're out of your mind. I said, this is not happening. I've been a miserable, crappy failure. I don't even know how to do that. This is not right. So anyway, later at, we were backstage because, of course, they were backstage passes. And <clears throat> the, it, the feeling came back and then said, comma, and you need to tell her tonight. And of course, I argued again, but you don't win those arguments. And so I did. And it went about like you would have expected. Like, are you out of your mind? <laughs> that kind of thing. Two weeks later, she had had her own set of experiences that convinced her this was right. She resigned her position. I left the contracts and money that I had that were worth millions, just walked away. I got to do something else. I've got to change life. I don't know how. I don't know what I'm going to do. And that was the beginning. And that was 14 and a half years ago. And so, or 14 years ago, a little over 14, 14 years ago. And it's been a, that, you know, that was a divine gift to help me through the long process of healing. And finally, I learned how to be a friend. I learned how to have a friend. I learned what it meant to love. She was the only sane person I'd ever attracted into my life. And I didn't do anything. It was a gift. The other people I'd been with, there was nothing wrong with them, except they had their own piles of problems. One of them's mom had committed suicide. One of them had been in her dad, her stepdad had been an abusive alcoholic. And I didn't know what that did to anybody. I didn't know anything about anything. So I didn't do anything at, at all about any of it. And of course that contributed along with my depression and lack of skill at being anything except go make money, you know, had been contributing to wrecking all the relationships. So that's uh, for the last 14 years, I've spent the, all of my life figuring out one, and this is the learnings, if there are any one, I'm responsible for my own life. I don't care what happened before. I don't care that I spent, wasted. I don't consider it a waste. I wouldn't trade any of it away, but it took 40 years for me to wake up. Okay. That means that from then on, I'm 65, so it's been 14 years now, roughly. I have the opportunity to do all the good that I can. So taking responsibility was the first thing I did, chose to do. Second was I, I, I refused to quit. That characteristic was the thing that helped me during my corporate stuff. Here it now became finally is an advantage. Like I'm not giving up. I, I won't give up. These things have happened for a reason. And so gradually over time, I began, I began to talk to somebody. So that was the other piece. I talk, start talking to counselors and telling them what happened and describing to them in complete detail all the things in my life. And one guy, one guy said, I'm surprised you're still alive. And I said, well, I've tried suicide twice. And so we went over that. And another guy said, you know, there's no question you've been dealing with MDD, major depressive disorder your whole life. I'm just surprised that it hasn't crushed you. And I said, well, obviously God has other plans. So that process, I began talking to people and I wrote books, started writing books. I wasn't an author, didn't even think about being an author until after all this happened. And since then I've written 13 books. I've got seven and more that I'm in the process of working on. And someone might ask, why are you, why don't you do one at a time? And the answer is, I don't know. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> so I've got seven more that I'm working on right now. And I will probably publish two or three a year until I don't breathe anymore. My, my mission and my purpose now is to help every single person who's had any kind of trauma understand nothing's permanent. I don't care where you've been. Start today. You can say it nicely or you can slam your fist on the table and say you've had enough take take control of your own life and then go figure out what the next step is even if it's a tiny one you know i i view all these divine things that happen to me as maybe i'm too dumb to hear the subtle signs so i need a two by four i don't know but that's kind of the story in the last 14 years i've created a coaching practice i have i coach clients around the world 
I help people figure out who they are and what their real gifts and talents are and live into that. Fantastic. And that's really the story. Brilliant. Well, it was a lot there. A lot there. <laughs> that was like 40 years in five minutes. <laughs> well, I wasn't sure how much detail you wanted. So. <laughs> no, it's all good. It's all good. It is what it is. It is what it is. Um, I love what you were saying about the resilience piece. I can really relate to that. And I think the more I'm speaking to people, the more I'm realizing actually that the resilience piece is a common thread that um, exists or exists, maybe not the right word, but people who have been through a lot of trauma, they are extremely resilient. They will get knocked down, get back up again, go full force, get knocked down, get back up again. I think that get knocked down, get back up again is some of the, the um, chaos that exists around trauma about you were saying that you were very successful in your corporate life or that you'd sabotage the job or something would happen. I think it's almost feeling like resilience we put ourselves or these situations manifest around us and we're constantly getting knocked back down and building resilience and pushing forward well and i finally I decided the thing i was addicted to wasn't any any substance whatever substance was handy would do alcohol any drug doesn't matter whatever's handy will do i finally figured out what i was addicted to was self-loathing mm -hmm. which came from that all that early experience that was the conviction that I wasn't okay. I was fundamentally flawed. I wasn't good enough. So when good things started happening and I made a lot of money and this and that, it's like, I can't be here. So then I would do the self-sabotage thing yeah. and get divorced and trash the job. And, you know, and it was, a, it was a case of, I don't deserve this. I can't have it kind of. And so I figured out the addiction was to self self-loathing and the substance was irrelevant it was whatever's handy yeah mm -hmm. yeah okay and you mentioned that you've been with your wife 14 years during that time did you experience any inner resistance within the relationship did you want to push her away was how did you manage your trauma within that relationship how did i manage my trauma badly at first um I have asked her many times. I mean, the people in the office knew the rumors. They knew that I was doing drugs and they knew that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I kept the job because of the reputation that I had and because I just was me. So I did it. And I had been brought from another country. I was in Canada. I'd been brought from the U.S. I did a year and a half search and I was the big hired gun. So I got to pretty much do what I wanted. And she knew that and she went anyway. And I've asked her many times, what on earth? convinced you to do that she said i don't know i just knew it was what i needed to do so that answer is the thing i had no road map yes i still didn't know how to treat a person i didn't know what love was i didn't know i didn't believe in anything except conditional relationships like it's only you're only okay if you only get tokens of affection if you only get okay pats on the head back butt whatever if I didn't know anything but that. And her determination, <clears throat> her determination to just do this because she said she was going to was infinite. And so that her resilience, <clears throat> like I, it, it was not easy. It was not simple. It was not complicated. She supported me. Go here. Let's try this. Go here. Try that. You know, you want to try antidepressants? Fine. Try this. Try that. Go talk to this guy. That guy sucks. Okay, fine. Go talk to that guy. Like whatever. And, you know, sometimes there, was pro there were problems between us because I didn't know how to understand regular relationships. One of the manifestations of my depression was that I felt like every single thing that got said was a personal attack on me. Anything that was wrong, I used to describe it as sanding my eyeballs. I felt like sandpaper in my eyeballs. Just everything felt like that. Mm -hmm. And we had a thousand conversations about something she would say. I would see, hear it as an attack. <clears throat> and rather than get mad, she would just say, well, I didn't, that isn't what I meant. And then I would say something like, how could you mean anything else? I remember one, excuse me, one particular conversation. She said, look, 
that isn't what I meant. And then I said, well, any sane person, any third party that heard you say those words would know what you meant. And what I, what I meant by that was that it was an attack on me. And she said, well, it wasn't. Later that day, I asked myself a single question. I was by myself and I thought, okay, I don't have any reason to not believe her. So if I look at the words she said, I asked myself the question, what else could that mean? And instead of just defaulting, like I always did to what's an attack on me or whatever, I don't even remember what the situation was, defaulting to that negativity, I just asked, well, what else? Not, what else could it mean? But what else could that mean? Well, and it, well, it could mean this. And when I started to do that, I began to realize that the words themselves don't mean anything. It is the context that we assign. And I had a vision of a, a remembrance of a vision that I had. I used to have season passes to a certain ski resort. And there were two lifts that went up on two different mountains, but they overlooked the same valley in the middle. And so from one lift, the valley looked one way. And from another lift, same valley looked a different way. And all of a sudden, I remembered that picture and I thought it looks different from a different mountaintop. And then asking that question, what else could it mean? All of a sudden, the whole framework just started to crumble of my interpretations, right? It all crumbled in a good way. And from then I'm like, wow, there is another mountaintop. So that became sort of the seminal phrase for me. There is another mountaintop, another view, another way to think about this. There is. The fact that I have never found it before, I found one now. So there is another mountaintop. That was a really important moment. So, that's, so I managed it poorly. She did better. Over the last years, it's been really good now, but the first six or seven were pretty tough. It reminds me of what you're saying. Something said, I mean, I've been with my partner 21 years now, and we... Oh, the first seven years or so, well, I don't know how he put up with me. I really don't. I was a nightmare. I did everything I did to try and get rid of him. <laughs> he stayed. <laughs> he stayed. It reminds me in terms of what you were saying about the difference between a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And trauma is so closely aligned to a fixed mindset. Right or wrong, left or right, black or white. There's no color in the middle. And it feels like what you discovered was, was the color in the middle. There are lots of different ways that you can see things. And that is such a magical moment of, uh, I've got goosebumps just talking about it. It's when you can come into the middle and see the variety of color and the opportunities rather than coming from that fear and insecure, you know, that horrible place of a traumatized mind, I call it everything starts to just melt, fall away. It's an incredible space to be in. Well, that's the way it felt to me was the whole, the whole framework of how I interpreted life and all of the attack, the whole framework of I'm nothing, I can't, everything's my fault. All of that just sort of, it felt like it all crumbled mm. at that moment. So it's just like what you said, it all melted, crumbled, whatever, disappeared. And I, I felt, found myself almost gasping for breath with the internal realization. I thought, holy crap, what else have I misunderstood? Mm -hmm. My first thought, you know, what else? Like, where else is this true? You know. <clears throat> you start to question everything. I questioned everything from that point. I sort of got in my head that everything I'd learned up until that point was a lie. It was, it just wasn't. It wasn't true. Whatever. I, I just questioned everything. Everything. I still question everything. Working with your clients, because I can imagine that you attract people that have had, you know, very similar experiences. It's just how it goes. It's it's really natural that that happens. What is a common theme that you see shows up for them that stops them from progressing within their business? The thing that no matter what the client comes for, I want to make more money. I want to cut my expenses. I want to fix my relationship. I want to be happier. I want to work less. It doesn't matter why they come. Within a month or two, we find ourselves working on the same thing. Mm -hmm. And it is simply this. Everything in your life 
is it, it comes because of how you choose to show up in the world each day. So if you can make a conscious choice about who you want to be and then figure out how you need to prepare to be that person every day. So for example, I am an honest person I, and I, everything I say is truth or I live in integrity. I do what I say and I am what I seem with no camouflage, duplicity or guile. So if a person says something like that in their own language, in their own thing, then everything that they measure is against that decisions become quick. They become easy. Well, I'm that, well, if I'm that, then of course I do this. And those choices are what really determine everything, including how much money you make and how successful business is. I'll give you an example. I had a client who owned a pharmacy and he came to me typically and he said, I need to double my revenue. Okay, cool. So we went over his business and where he got his money and you know, what things were the most susceptible to growth and et cetera, et cetera. And then I, we talked for a while about why should people come to his pharmacy as opposed to somebody else's? What was his value add, his unique value proposition, that sort of thing. And finally, one day after we worked, I would say I beat the crap at him for a few weeks. He said, okay, I believe that healthcare is not transaction-based, but relationship-based. And I spun around and I said, we can sell that. I said, we can sell that. So then we started working on that. And it turned out that the barrier was him not wanting to talk about himself or to use social media or to do things that would get him on television or do those kinds of things because he had the story that that was not you know, he was afraid of it. And so again, and then we fixed that and then he made more than double and on, on and on. But the thing is, it wasn't anything about knowing what to do. It was, he was not doing what he knew. And so when we finally teased out his, the thing that he was willing to stand on, I believe this. Okay, fine. The thing that kept it or slowed it, made it slower to go was that was the story about what he should and shouldn't do which is what you were talking about, a whole should and shouldn't thing. As soon as we got that fixed, then it's like he was all over the place and his business exploded. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. Visibility is definitely, is definitely one of the biggest things that I come across, self-worth and visibility. And if those are missing, it makes it so much more difficult for a person to thrive. They, they just get stuck in this perpetuous loop of doing exactly the same thing day in and day out, same problems day in and day out, same triggers without being able to move past it. So it's such, it's such an important thing. And I, don't, I think you're right. I don't think it matters whether, you know, whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a CEO. Well, that's just, it's, part, it's a life lesson. Yeah, to, uh, the way I describe it, and people can describe it lots of ways, it's, it's just a choice of who you want to be and making that declaration and then choosing how you're, if I'm that, then how do I prepare, how does that being, a being that is though, has those characteristics and qualities, if that's who I am, how does that show up in the world? Like at work, at home, talking to friends, when, you've, when you're clear about who you decide that you are, not because somebody told you, you don't need anybody's permission. That's a personal declaration of who you want to be. Okay, if that's who you are, how does that show up in the world? Those answers are really easy. Oh, well, then I do this and I do this. Okay, cool. Let's do that. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's a conscious decision rather than doing something on automatically on automatic pilot, defining and acting that way until it becomes second nature or first nature. Is it second nature or first nature? I don't know. Whichever one it is. <laughs> what it is. Think about it. <laughs> but the key for me is you don't need anybody's permission. Yeah. And in fact, if you think you do, then it isn't your own declaration. The declaration yeah. has to be who you want to be in the world. Why? Because I said so. Good enough. Earlier on, brilliant. I mean, earlier on, you said that it took you 30 years to um, have the realization that it all came to head, everything. What are some of the signs? Because I was in trauma denial for so, so long. What are some of the signs do you think that people can look out for who, have ex who don't realize that what they're experiencing actually is trauma? They're living with trauma, but they haven't 
<clears throat> being able to grasp that actually that's what it is. It's like there's there's a disassociation between no, this is this is how it is, it's okay, it, it's fine, I can deal with that. I, I when I work with people, I just ask them if they're happy. Not if they tolerate life. Mm. Are you happy? Is what you experience day to day happiness? Do you smile? How how is your heart feeling? And if the answers are not, you know, if they're either, well, you know, it's okay. That may be true, but it's telling me and you, then we talk about that. What is okay? What would it what would it be like if we're not okay, but great? Like mm. what does great mean if that's a six or a seven out of ten? What would ten look like? Like what would need to be happening? And they might say, whatever, have a lot of money, have this, have that, have a better relationship. Okay. Like nothing is too outrageous. That's fine. Why do you suppose you don't have that right now? Why do you suppose it's a six or a seven? You're, you're settling. Like if, if you really want that, okay, fine. Why don't we have that right now? Like what's in the way of that? And I talk about it like it's over there. Yeah. You know, okay, <clears throat> like what is in the way as you go to that place? <clears throat> and all kinds of things come up, you know, economy and circumstance, and I have no choice, and I'm too old, and my time's passed, and I have all these obligations, and blah, 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 blah. And the answer is, yeah, you do have all those obligations. Yeah, you are 30, 40, 50, 60. You are. Cool. Does that mean, no matter what, that you have to stay right where you are? What if you did this? Well, I can't do that. Why not? Well, but you could. Well, I could, but then this and this happens. Is that bad? You know, just in the, being in the question, like, yeah. and, and acting like whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. You know. I love, I love the simplicity of that. That's a, it's fantastic. Cause then you can get into the story and then you can start challenging and shifting perspective. It's lovely really lovely to start with i always treat it like it's over there like what no. is that thing that's in the way like what is that oh well who said you were that well i'm not organized i'm this okay cool who who made that rule yeah that's one of my favorite questions is who made that rule well i guess i did okay cool when did you make that rule do you suppose we can unmake that could there be a scenario where that is not the rule you know, just explore possibilities yeah. in a in a sort of light and easy way nice. until they come to the place they realize that number one, they made the rules, two, they're ridiculous, three, they're vaporware, and you can do whatever you want. <laughs> See, here's the thing about recovery, I think, is it just does not need to be complicated. Actually, the easier and the more simple you make it, the easier it is to to navigate, to to move forward. It doesn't need to be complicated. I have a friend who is a client, also a friend, but a client is not an active client now, but this individual had been on antidepressants for 20, 30 years, and they <clears throat> were acting like a person on antidepressants, like barely getting by, you know, barely. And they wanted to change, or at least they thought they did. When we talked about, well, have you explored this? Have you tried you know, changing things. Have you tried this? Do you, there's all kinds of natural ways that increase serotonin and the other stuff for that SSRIs and other things are supposed to help, you know, meditation, light levels, uh, how much you sleep and on and on and on. Are you optimizing those things? Have you played with it? Like when I was, when I took, uh, they tried me on a bunch of different antidepressants. I tried them, tried this and that. And I noticed right away, this one makes me sleepy. This one does this, this one does that. Okay, well, what, what else can I do? And that's what I mean by take ownership. Like, this is my life, and I'm going to play with all the tools until I find some that work. Thank you very much. And this person had sort of abdicated everything to the pill. Yeah. Like, I don't care if you need to take a pill, but why don't you play with it and see which is the best pill? And maybe you need less, and maybe there's ways to do not. And I would blow off the meds for a while, and I'm just to see how I felt different. And you know what I mean? To see if the edginess came back. And when I didn't take stuff for a week, sometimes Joy would say, uh, yeah, the sandpaper's back. I'm like, okay. So we notice this and we'll try stuff. But that was an active process. Yeah. Yeah. It is that conscious piece, isn't it? It's about becoming conscious 
And, you know, trauma for me has been um, holistic. It hasn't been one thing. It's been a multitude of different disciplines, a multitude of different things that I have to use to, to on a daily basis to manage. It's not, um, trauma is still part of me. I just manage it. It will never disappear completely. The emotional feeling, the emotional, you know, that real deep emotional connection to it, the rawness of it has um, subsided, subsided. But for me, it's been a very holistic, you know, a bit of this, a bit of that, that works, that doesn't work, this works. And building a, I call it a ritual, a ritual, a routine around that. It's funny because when I wrote my first book about my journey, my journey of depression, I wrote this one, Tightrope of Depression, My Journey from Dark, Despair, and Death to Light, Love, and Life. I didn't think I was going to write any more about it. And I, got, I told the story of my childhood and the divorces and the drugs and all this and that, and the divine intervention and everything else. And I thought I was done. And about a month or two or three after I was done, I thought, I guess we're not done. <laughs> This, this is an ongoing process. So then I wrote volume two called Down from the Gallows. Wow. The Gallows, the myth, the truth, and battles of a creative with depression. Wow. And this is like a hundred vignettes of ongoing process doing what you yeah. just described. And finally, I realized that there, it's a trilogy. And the third one will be out the end of next year. I oh, promise. Wow. Or, but there's going to be a fourth, I mean, a third one. And with each of those books, I've written an album of original music. Uh, oh, with right. 11 songs on each album. Yeah, telling the wow. story, songs about the stuff in the books. You're frightening me. You're frightening me because I'm writing a book, just about to finish it. And it's <clears> the first book I think, well, I don't know about you, but for me, it's been such hard work. And I'm like, I'll never write another book. And you're like, I think you're on your fourth one. And I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> well, I've written 13. So what happened oh. is I, I developed the process. I developed a real process, and then I wrote the book called The Story Arc, Practical and Persuasive Magic for Speakers, Authors, and Storytellers. Wow, brilliant. It's a book about writing books. Awesome. <laughs> you couldn't stop. <laughs> no, well, now I run seminars. Some of my clients are authors, and so I help them yep. figure out how to write compelling books. I don't really work with authors writing fiction and it's not about writing you know dune or whatever but people that are writing nonfiction yeah. about their life and that kind of thing it's that is i wrote it because i didn't find anything that was helpful and it was this great painful process and i thought we don't have to do that maybe this is the, the last um, thing we should finish on then and that is about the power of stories and how once we awaken to how much trauma we've been through and we can take ownership ownership we can start healing it from the inside out is is the power we have to change and rewrite our story and to create the outcome we want rather than our trauma dictating on automatic pilot the chaos we find ourselves in i, I love that description and phrasing tomorrow will not be a repeat of today unless we let it tomorrow is always blank you have the stories, you have had the trauma, it shaped you the way that it did. No one's arguing with that. The question that I have to answer, you have to answer all of us is, am I going to allow the, the, the lineup of blank tomorrows be a repeat of the past? I have allowed that for a day, a week, a month, a year, a decade. Okay, today I'm going to alter the trajectory just a little. Let's see where that goes, because tomorrow is blank. I do get to change it even a little like one of my favorite authors, Nathaniel Brandon does it this way. He says, what would happen if you took like 1% more responsibility for X tomorrow? What would that look like? What would you do different? If it's just 1%, well, that's not hard to figure. Well, I do this a little different. Okay. Do that. See what happens and play the game. You yeah. Know. <clears throat> that's play the game. Yeah, and if you think of two paths, one is predictable. Um, you're going to always get the same outcome. You're always going to end up with the um, same story. But if you just take it a little, you know, a little bit off, you create a completely different story, which you're more in control of. It's, it's mind-blowing. 
that that to me is the most important part of all this. You have control. And the minute I, the minute I go to the place of, I had no choice. I've, I've lost, I've abdicated my right to choose my sovereign and divine right to determine who I'm going to be. And I don't control anybody else's actions, behavior, whether or not they, for two years after I got sober, many of the kids didn't believe I was sober. So they were mad at me and said I was hiding it and lying and still a drug addict. And I'd been clean, like squeaky clean for two years. They wouldn't buy it. I can't. And that used to kill me. I used to make it really hard. But it's like, what do I have to do? And the answer is nothing. I don't have to do anything. I'm just going to be who I am. And I'm going to be the best I can and full of love and open. And when you're ready, then you're ready. I don't control them. I can't make anybody believe, not believe, jump up and down, dance or do anything else. I'm going to do what I need to do so that I can add good to the world so I can realize my divine potential. I refuse to be locked up in the old path. I won't go there. Yeah, it, it, it makes such a difference when you take personal responsibility for yourself, your own emotions, because then that it filters outwards. Otherwise, you're just reacting to other people and trying to be someone you're not, when you're never going to be able to answer those questions anyway, because that's a, that's a trust thing on their part. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I just want to say I really appreciate you sharing your story. It's been absolutely fascinating. And I hope in the future that actually we'll be able to come back together and maybe talk about one of the other books in terms yeah, of, you know, you were saying that it's a continuous journey and that, you know, it's <laughs> it pops well, its head out and goes, hello. <laughs> Volume two is really hard to write. I got yeah. stuck in the middle. I thought even with my own story arc and all that other stuff, I just, I, I you know, the stories of, oh, I don't know, maybe this doesn't matter and who cares and whatever. And then at the end, when I got done, I realized that it was really good chronicle of the truth, the myths and the battles of a creative with depression, which is the subtitle. It's like all present tense, all ongoing it's a it's a process of continuing to take ownership. This is mine and you can't take it away from me, i.e. my life. And I'm going to do with it what I want, not what you think. Not you, but any you. you know, the, <laughs> the generic you, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I, exactly. That's uh, that's it. And I, I now have a podcast, too, that I started a funny way. The beginning of the pandemic, March of last year, 2020, uh, I do a lot of motivational and speaking and events and stuff. And somebody called my wife when the lockdowns were just starting in March. And she said, I said, the guy said to her, uh, does Kellen have a podcast? Cause he was looking for motivational stuff. And my wife said, yes. <laughs> he does now. She came, down, she came downstairs and looked at me and said, we have a podcast. <laughs> so I started that in March of last year and I just recorded episode 480 something. So I have 400. I, know. I was daily, like, what? <laughs> daily 15 minute podcast called your ultimate life. But my here's, here's the thing. This reminds me of what you said earlier on about resilience. That's resilience. That's your resilience muscle. That's just gone. Yep. I'm on it. Let's do it. Well, it's funny. We have a podcast. What? <laughs> <laughs> I can't told... believe how many shows you've done. I nearly fell off my seat. I was like, oh my God, that's wow. That's that's commitment. That's absolutely awesome. Okay. Well, I wasted a lot of years, so I'm excited about the opportunity to do yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. One of my absolutely. favorite phrases is add good to the world. I mean, everything we do, we add something besides carbon dioxide, and we might as well choose that. <laughs> the world so remind me of the podcast remind me of the book and reminds me of how people can get hold of you okay the podcast is your ultimate life with kellen flukiger and you do have to spell the name right it's on all the podcast platforms apple awesome. amazon itunes deezer spotify blah 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 the book the one about me is all you really have to do is go to amazon.com and spell my name right and there's a whole bunch of books and a bunch of music and a bunch of other stuff but the books we talked about today are tightrope of depression and the other one is down from the gallows and to get a hold of me i got a website 
www.kellenflukiger.com uh, social media. I'm really easy to find. There's only two Kellen Flukigers out of 8 billion people. And the other one's my son. There, there aren't any more. If you put that in Google, there's only me. Awesome. And all my stuff. So Love that. Uh, <laughs> not hard to find. <laughs> Last and final note, I know you've already covered this, but what is the one thing you absolutely want people to take away? That you, no matter where you've been, no matter what has happened to you, and I say, I don't say that lightly, no matter where you've been and no matter what has happened to you, it is never too late to matter and to have big impact as you discover and manifest your divine gifts. Lovely. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for your time today. And I appreciate you for sharing your, your story with us. Thank you. We'll see you again. <laughs>